This is episode 44. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. I am your host, Enoch Sears, Architects. Welcome back to the Business of Architecture show. As you know, Business of Architecture is here to help you find success and figure out how to focus on what you love in architecture. Today, we have the privilege and honor of having Mariana Iliarte with us today. She's a business consultant for creative professionals, and she's graciously taking her time out right now. She's in the Netherlands, and I believe it's quite a bit later there. So thank you, Mariana, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Enoch. Thanks for having me in the show. Could you tell me a little bit about what it means to be a business consultant for you for creative professionals? Sure. Um, well, I should start giving you a little bit of introduction to my background, maybe. I studied, I was born in Argentina, and after finishing high school, I studied architecture for a few years until I decided I actually wanted to study advertising. So I went and finished uh, my studies in advertising and communication then. Uh, at that time, I was actually working with architects already uh, for government institutions. And uh, then uh, I moved to the Netherlands. I, I met a Dutch man, so I love brought me here. And when I came here, I started working from my communication background for KPMG, a uh, large uh, accountancy firm, world now. And uh, I, from one thing to the other, uh, I started managing a team of uh, internal communications for an IT department and before I knew it I was also negotiating contracts with IT suppliers globally until I started missing the creative sector where I've always felt happy and I dropped KPMG and I took the baggage and all I've learned uh, from my previous experiences and went to work for OMA, the office of architect Rem Colhas in Rotterdam as a contract manager. I spent a couple of years there negotiating contracts uh, for OMA uh, worldwide as well, uh, from architecture projects to publications from master plans to uh, catwalk design for Prada. So a lot of diverse things until I was up to a new challenge. And uh, actually, the idea of starting working uh, on my own as a consultant uh, initiated when uh, some ex-colleagues and architects friends of mine started asking me uh, for some help doing business. Uh, they asked, asked me for help to negotiate contracts they have, uh, they were complicated, they started to, they started their own firms, I needed someone to help them given the first steps doing business and so the idea of uh, starting working as a consultant and advising people and helping them uh, with their businesses uh, became a reality. So I've been doing that for the past uh, four years and uh, I've been having a lot of fun and I help uh, architects and sometimes designers, artists and some cultural organizations as well in everything that is related to doing business and dealing with the market. So, and the majority of your clients, I know you're based in the Netherlands, are most of your clients from Europe? Where do, where do you find yourself serving, finding your clients? Well, you could say that my focus are the uh, firms that operate internationally. I mean, I obviously have an international background and a lot of international experience. So that is something I love and I, I like to help uh, people that want to uh, uh, be entrepreneurs internationally or work internationally as well. Because I speak also multiple languages, I, I help with a lot of different uh, firms, uh, mainly European based, uh, but also firms that are based in Europe and do business in Asia, for instance, in China or Africa or even South America. And uh, well, my, my network uh, uh, is, is very large and international. So I found myself sometimes talking to people in Mexico or China last uh, week. Um, yeah, whatever people go, I'll be there. <laughs> 
Fascinating. Well, I wanted to focus today's conversation on negotiation. That's something we haven't touched upon on the show here. And you have hours and hours of negotiation experience under your belt. So I would just love to get behind the scenes of what goes on in a typical negotiation. What was it like working for OMA? Uh, what went into a typical contract negotiation? Take me sort of through that process and how that works. Well, typical is an interesting word to talk about negotiations. I think uh, every every single negotiation is different because the players are always different. Uh, it's uh, it's about uh, people uh, on clients that have their own expectations. They bring their own culture. They have their own objectives. So every single negotiation is different from the other. Uh, what is typical, or you could name typical about negotiations, is that there are certain areas that uh, you typically will want to discuss and agree on, uh, being uh, main issues like uh, copyrights, intellectual property rights regarding to your work as an architect, uh, limitation of liability, which is another important uh, uh, subject to discuss, and uh, things like, uh, of course, the, the scope of the work and uh, on all that comes uh, within a uh, within discussing uh, together with the work the your fees of course and, and payments etc but there's a lot more uh, to that i do believe that uh you know negotiation starts when you uh the very first moment you start talking to a prospect uh, then is when the negotiation actually starts. People don't realize about it, but before you know it, you're already promising things and making statements of things you can deliver or making promises and uh, or giving away things, even hoping to get an assignment, a commission. And, uh, and, and, and that's the moment where actually negotiation starts, even before you get a contract in your hands and you start talking about terms and conditions. And is that a mistake for architects to or creative professionals to start to offer things before uh, formal negotiations have taken place? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a mistake as long as you know what you're doing. Uh, uh, like in, in every aspect uh, that I advise on, whether it's negotiation, whether it's marketing, whether it's business strategy, uh, communications, I always say strategy is the key. Uh, a strategic approach to whatever you do helps you uh, getting as close as you can to your goals. And being uh, working strategically means nothing more than having a plan, uh, having clear what are your goals, uh, what are the ways you can take, was the road you're going to take uh, and go for go for it. So uh, with negotiations, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, the, the moment you approach a potential client, uh, you have to know what what you actually want from from that. Or even in the best case scenario, if you get a project, what, how that project will help you uh, in your overall strategy. Where is it going to get you? Uh, a good friend of mine is a lawyer uh, specializing in intellectual property right and he says always begin with the end in mind. Uh, think about how to want to look back at things. Think of the, 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 how, how would you want things uh, working out. Uh, that helps you already uh, handle possible situations on, on, on keeping in mind different scenarios. And, and you're better for things that inevit inevitably are, are going to happen that you don't know, but at least you have thought about possibilities and, and you're be better prepared to react. Are there certain points that seem to be, that come up in every negotiation that seem to be a little bit more difficult to deal with? Are there sticking points for both parties that take more negotiation? Um. There are, uh, like you said, I've negotiated hundreds of contracts and um, there are not particular points that you could say they're coming back. There are central points that are uh, 
uh, more important for, for one client to the other. The important thing in a, in a negotiation process is to be alert to what, uh, what does it mean when some particular condition or point is becoming difficult to negotiate. Uh, sometimes it's like the red lights should start blinking when a client is very difficult about something. It's like, what's the thought behind it? What is he worried about? Uh, that's, that's the interesting thing about negotiation. Uh, many people think, oh, I don't want to deal with that. I just want to get over it and just sign and agree. But the negotiation process is actually very, very valuable to understand the other party to get to know each other and it's going to be the basis for the future relationship uh, through the design process, construction process or, or the hopefully uh, long and happy lives together. Uh, the, the way you negotiate, the way you, the positions you take during the negotiation are, are going to determine how negotiations are going to uh, continue working in the future because Remember that the negotiations doesn't finish when uh, you sign the contract. They're actually just starting. You're going to be negotiating during the whole process, whether it is to make decisions on, on the design, uh, on how to approach uh, unexpected difficulties that come on the road, uh, when you have to negotiate with contractors uh, that are going to actually uh, build whatever you've designed. No matter what it is, uh, you're going to be negotiating all the time, we do it all the time. So it is very important to be conscious about the negotiation process and, and again being alert to what happened. If, if, a, if, a, if a client, for instance, is very worried about uh, termination clauses and getting that settled, is that you have to wonder what is the problem? Is, is there any possibility that he actually might terminate his contract? Uh, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, why is it so important for you? Why? What are you worried about? And um, help to help the client to manage any risk that the situation may have. Uh, so they, it's it, there's not a single issue. Uh, it depends really on, on what the situation is, on the 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 place you're negotiating, the culture of the sector you're working on. It depends on the million things. The important thing is to be alert on if things are being difficult, there is a reason for it. And the more you spend trying to understand what it is and helping to resolve it, the, the better you're off solving it. Got it. That's a good listening skill. Mariana, so the audience of this show is sol solo architects, uh, sole practitioners, and smaller firms. What mm -hmm. tips, what are the top tips that you would give architects to think about when they're thinking about negotiating? Okay, when negotiating is, uh, the first one is, is like, uh, like I said, uh, thinking strategically. Uh, especially small firms or people working by their own, you get very excited when you have a prospect of, of a project. Uh, and uh, it's very soon people get, you know, they're, get on the table on their computers and start designing and drawing and um, I always said hold your horses, take the time, uh, take the time to get to know your client, to understand uh, what his goals are. Uh, this is something that uh, people tend to confuse very often. They think oh the goal for someone is to have this built and um, that rarely is the goal. The goal for someone is to have a nice place to uh, for his family or for kids to grow. The goal of someone else is to have a fantastic uh, house built to impress his colleagues or environment or whoever it is. Uh, the goal of a dentist is to get more patients feeling comfortable in his practice by having a nice place design. Whatever it is, uh, the, the goal of someone else is just making money uh, out of whatever you're going to build. But having clear what the expectations of the other part and understand it takes sometimes a lot of more time than just discussing about how you work as an architect. Um, that is one of one of the first things I would say. Take take time to understand where the client wants to go. 
Second, also take time to understand uh, what are any factors influencing uh, the clients you're working with. Uh, understanding the negotiation, what are the roles that the people around play? Whether it's a particular client, for instance, and you talk, you may talk to one of the parties, but what are the other players uh, uh, thinking about who influence the decisions of the party you're dealing with? Uh, sometimes it happens in more complex projects as well, even for very small firms where you're doing a project for uh, a government institution, for instance, and uh, you have uh, here in the Netherlands, there's a lot of regulations and you have even the uh, neighbors' commissions giving their opinion or having the right to refuse to anything that's going to be built on their streets and uh, or environmental organizations or whomever you may think of. It's very important to have a complete picture of all the players that may or not have influence in the negotiation process. Then uh, who is the decision maker? Are you actually talking to the right person? Sometimes there's a, a, a someone you who loves your ideas, is right on with you, but actually at the moment of signing or at the moment of giving approval is, oh, actually I have to talk to someone else and someone you've never met maybe or someone you have to sell over again. So uh, knowing who the decision maker is is very important. And, uh, and one of the things I mentioned first is things strategically, think how, what do you want from this commission? What do you want from this client? Are you doing this because uh, it's a, something that's just going to pay the bills and you want to get through this? Uh, it is something that you actually love doing, it's going to be fun, it's an opportunity for your firm, uh, it's a strategic movement. Uh, whatever your your own goals are uh, for that project are also very important to be clear about it because then you can determine what importance you can give it uh, through the negotiation process to those aspects as well. So uh, th those are the main things that I happen see, uh, I, I happen to see often, great, sometimes great. going wrong. <laughs> tell me, tell me, give me an example from your past about something where strategy you were able to apply strategy to the situation and where it helped you out and was really pivotal in the negotiation. To help me, to help me understand better um, what goes into the strategy. What goes into the strategy? Um, uh, yes, I can definitely give you one so, example. Yeah, maybe if you can give me a typical a, project. Recently, yeah. I, I recently, then the past year, year and a half or so, there's a, a, a small architect's firm. There are two people who uh, work regularly uh, with them. Uh, and they have this uh, commission, uh, or at least this possibility to a commission, uh, for a project here in the Netherlands. They are based in the Netherlands, but they actually do a lot of work in other countries, in Germany, France, the UK. Uh, so they actually have done very little in the Netherlands. And so the problem was, uh, it, it was it was a project with a very low budget, and the organization seemed particularly difficult as well to work with. There were a lot of issues there. And uh, so they consulted me on, okay, how do we approach this? And one of the things I, I asked them to is reflect on your overall strategy. Why would you get into this project? It's not going to pay well. And um, the people uh, seem to be quite a pain to work with. Uh, and there's a lot of other things underneath that don't seem easy to resolve. Why do you want to do this? Um, their, quest, their, their reason was strategically saying, well, I think this would give us uh, much more experience in our portfolio to work in the Netherlands because uh, we don't have much experience here. It would be good to do it from that point of view. So I said, well, okay, if that is your goal, uh, it's good to do it. But keep in mind, this is the way I'm seeing it. There's no room to get all the other things working better. Uh, it is going to be complicated and uh, it's not going to pay well and you're going to be working a lot longer through this than you expect to. If you're okay with all of that and you think it's worth pursuing it because it may 
give you that experience and add into your portfolio on bringing you a new context locally, that's fine, go for it. So they did that and it, it went exactly as I had predicted, <laughs> very painful relationship uh, with the organization. Uh, it, it paid pretty lousy and uh, on, it, it was very, very complicated. So uh, it, was it great to do it? Well, they, at least they knew what they were up to and at least they knew what the limitations were. Uh, you know, it's, I think what is worth it is getting to a realistic uh, uh, view of what are the expectations you can actually have of a project and look critically about what is it actually, what's in it for me, uh, so the work. So that, that is that's an, it's an example to, okay, well, while you're working on that, you're also learning, you know, it, there were moments, critical moments of confrontation with the client, things they were working on, um, they were at least very aware, they were not surprised by what would happen. It was like, okay, we knew this could happen. And so you, uh, ideally you spend in that situation less more energy and on time, or you have taken measures to manage the risk that uh, knowing that this could happen. That is a, a not very happy example. Maybe. Well, and uh, did you have a chance to follow up with them and see if they were pleased with their decision to go ahead and do that? Uh, they, they were pleased because they got they got a lot of very good feedback from other people actually and joined the project after it was realized. Uh, so so they were pleased on doing that, uh, but they've learned that in if they were to encounter this the same situation or the same conditions, they probably would say no and just put your energy to pursue something else. Very interesting. Do you have another example where you could talk about how um, there was a decision made and the strategy was not in place and as a result, bad things happened? Well, uh, I have another example that uh, it, it has to do with, with with lack of strategy. Totally, you could say uh, this has a happy ending, so it's good. And it, it's an, it's an interesting example. It's again another small firm uh, designing a holiday house uh, for a client, uh, and I happen to know the client as well very well. So it was very interesting to hear both stories from, from both sides. Uh, and uh, the situation here is that they got very excited because it, they have this commission and they talked to the, uh, the the man of the house, the commissioner, uh, on his oldest son. Uh, all the time they had like three meetings or something talking only to them. Uh, they got very excited about their ideas and his oldest son telling about going on holidays with his friends, et cetera, et cetera, and having fun. So they came, there was a point where they went to their current family home and actually met the rest of the family, including the wife. So they, what happened is that these architects came again with a lot of drawings already about how the house would look like and their, to show their ideas and impress. Well, this was, this went totally wrong and it wasn't received as they expected because the wife of the house, uh, well, she didn't like the idea of having this fun hotel full of young people all the time. She said, this is so not what I'm expecting. I want a holiday house to rest, to relax and no guests all around. It, it was just a total different idea uh, <laughs> what her expectations were. Uh, the funny thing is that I, I, I knew both people and they're both really nice uh, and they, they got through this shock and they talked and they, they were able to uh, restore the faith <laughs> they had kind of lost. Uh, but this is also a good example of what I said before about get to know the people who's, who's influencing, who has a saying on, on the decision making and take your time to understand all the players so that you can talk with your design to every single one of them and address their expectations uh, at once. This could have gone very wrong. It, it went very wrong at one point because this, this woman got totally mad at us. They're crazy. And 
uh, it, it, it was actually very nice so they gave them another opportunity <laughs> to count these guys and come up with something else uh, but it was also a lot of uh, uh, spoiled energy and time uh, obviously because they were designing already something that went directly to the garbage bin uh, while if they had taken the time of thinking strateg strategically talking to all the players understanding and then only agreeing what to do the process would have gone a lot smoother and they wouldn't have put the commission at risk as they did and uh, well the things could have gone more more easily they also learn a good lesson after that yeah i would have loved to be a fly on the wall in the room when that conver when the architects were pulling out the presentation <laughs> boards i mean i can just imagine the conversation going <laughs> exactly on. that's great so we've you've shared with us some of the overall strategy of negotiations can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about more of the tactical details of a little bit more the nitty-gritty back and forth and give us some tips on that on that side sure well uh like i said on strategy you start thinking about okay wh what do i actually want to get uh, from here uh you, you can think of the overall negotiation strategy uh, most typically there will be several uh, uh sessions that you will have through the negotiation process whether it's actually meeting face to face having phone calls or even emailing back and forth documents, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have an overall strategy, but you can also have a strategy per meeting, for instance. And one of the, you know, the, the tactical elements that you can use is actually uh, managing meetings. Uh, also something that I see extremely often, uh, is, especially with architects working by themselves, uh, is that say they go into the process and discuss things, but uh, they don't manage the meeting. With managing the meeting, I'm talking about start with uh, agreeing on an, an agenda. What are you going to actually discuss during the meeting? Who has to be there to make the decisions? Do you have the right people attending to the meeting? Uh, what are the expectations? What are you actually going to decide by the end of the meeting what is what you want to achieve and share that with the other parties involved so they all are in agreement beforehand of what the meeting is going to be i've been in meetings where people have been talking for three hours and now nothing has been achieved because simply there was no agenda and someone took over the meeting and so it's, it's time wasted on be aware as an architect, especially when we're handling with people that are very uh, seasoned salespeople or more commercially minded. They're very, very good at handling meetings, manipulating the situation to actually not achieve anything. Because then there's a point when you have of meetings, nothing actually has been agreed. And then, oh, we're wasting time. Now we have a deadline. Now we have to agree. Uh, you're in the time pressure and you lost your negotiation power upfront. So the first thing starts with managing the meetings, having an agenda, agreeing on it, agree on what the roles are going to be of every party at the table and take notes or agree who's going to do it. If you cannot take them, bring someone else to take notes for you. Uh, or taking notes as well is ticking the boxes of your agenda and going from point to point and actually time your meeting as well. If you have an hour or two, uh, make sure you allocate the time for each point you're going to discuss uh, so that you get, actually get through the agenda and complete things. If you're stuck at some point or you're not achieving agreement, on, you can. the best thing you can do sometimes is to park those things and say, you know what, we're going to park this issue Let's continue and focus on something that maybe you can resolve more quickly and get into actually, you know, focus on the positives. Uh, when com the negotiation gets stuck, you, it's, it's worth stopping for a minute and say, let's take a break. Let's see what we've already achieved. Uh, that brings more of a positive note. Then you can say more easily, I'm sure we can get through these last two points 
for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's something that, uh, that that management of an agenda of the meeting of knowing where we're going on agreeing on what the actions point are going further something is left on uh, by when things have to be resolved or someone has to get back to you um, afterwards make sure that you share again just minutes of your meeting and that uh, the other parties have the opportunity of add or commenting on, on, on what you've, you've given. That is something essential because many, many things uh, are decided in these conversations and sometimes no one has taken note of that. Um, those are actually crucial elements in the negotiation. You see very often that people start working without signing contracts or some projects, even if they're small, the contracts are not even signed. And so things that you've agreed on, at least you send by email, they are as valid as contract and, uh, and, and there's no uh, doubt about uh, what, what the agreement was if the parties had ch the chance to, to check on them. So that is one of the things that are most important too. Together with preparation, prepare for a meeting. Uh, Tell me a little bit about preparation and why that's important. Can you give me an example on that? Certainly, I, I've seen, I've been in, in meetings, uh, even with very senior architects and experienced people, and they were not prepared to the meeting. And the meeting goes totally, uh, you know, like like all all, all the way uh, to papers on the table and all this organized. There's not an introduction. There are some architects that haven't slept in three, in three days finishing the work that they had to do. So they didn't have to pre time to prepare. Uh, and they didn't even shower for two days, you know? And these are the type of things that uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, this happens not only in the small firms, it happens in the large firms as well. And, and it's, it's terrible. You're, you're losing, uh, you may be losing a client even. Uh, I, I've been in a situation of, uh, as well, I, I, architects I know very well. Um, they, they were in one of the situations of very stressed with a deadline and they have a very high profile client actually. Someone who's in a high position in a bank, someone who's accustomed to a totally different environment. And actually, they got the commission because his wife is a, is a, is an artist, and she's a friend of these architects. And he actually told them in their faces, "The only reason when I'm going with, with you is I'm trusting my wife, <laughs> and this uh, because after your the way you're presenting your appearance and this very informal and, and not organized way of working, I would never hire you." He actually told them this. Uh, so it, you have to be sensitive uh, to the type of people you're dealing with. In some environments, it's just simply more important that you present yourself in a professional way, that you show your work prepared, and even even the way you're talking to people, the way you're dressed. Uh, make sure that you organize your presentation and, and your meeting uh, in a way that shows professionalism. Uh, unfortunately. Not if, it doesn't matter how fantastic your design is, sometimes it just doesn't speak for itself. Uh, that is where some architects go wrong, thinking, but my design is fantastic, but the way you presented it, uh, if it's not great, it could cost you uh, a commission. Very interesting. Now, I, I'm loving the stories and, and hearing a little bit about you know what goes on in that world of, of the contract negotiation are there can you give me an example of some time when there was a sticking point where the where the negotiation almost came to a halt and what that was like what it was over and then how it eventually got resolved well I can give you an example uh, which uh, it actually something that it didn't get re got, get resolved but it, it's a good example of what i was talking about earlier about when when the red lights start blinking yeah um uh there was a negotiation and this was in my time at oma it was a it was a very large project uh, it was a very high profile client um, um there was the the team had actually started working because it was a 
uh, time issue as well, time pressure to complete the project. So there were a lot of things going on and we were negotiating contract and when we thought it was ready, they kept coming back with something else they wanted to change or something else they wanted to add. And we were like, what the heck is going on? I mean, we thought we'd gone through everything already and there were kept th coming things, et cetera, et cetera. What happened was that uh, this, this project was uh, in an area that needed some uh, government approval to actually be realized. And the client, again, it was someone high profile and he thought everything was under control and they were lobbying, etc., and that it would, would go on and, and get it. Uh, to our surprises, to everybody's surprises, that didn't happen. They, act, they actually never got the permits that they needed. Uh, so the project couldn't go on. So what this client was actually doing was postponing the signing of the agreement because he just wanted to make sure to save his back that he was not going to sign until he was 100% sure he was actually able to realize the project. Uh, we didn't see that. Uh, we thought we'd we rely on the high profile of the client and his contacts and his power. Um, we thought, okay, he's, he said he's going to sort it. Uh, we believe that. Uh, but that was actually a very clear example of, of what I meant with the symptoms that you can uh, notice during negotiation process. It's like there, there wasn't anything left to negotiate. Um, they kept coming with things to resolve. And, and it wasn't for nothing. So it was a clear example of that. Fascinating. Now, can, okay, so with the sole practitioners and smaller firms, I'm just going to put out there sort of a typical process that I see. Mm -hmm. And if you could then comment on that and give suggestions for improvement or how you think it should go, that'd be great. So typically sure. when an architect gets a lead, they'll have a sit-down face-to-face meeting, maybe one or two meetings where they discuss the needs of the client and they go through a discovery process to figure out, you know, the programmatic elements of the project. And then at mm -hmm. that point, there's maybe a little bit of discussion about timeline, a little bit of discussion about budget. Then the architect will go back, prepare the proposal with the services that he or she believes that the client wants, and then they'll just send that off to the client and they'll wait for a response. Mm -hmm. Now, is there anything about that process that can be improved? Um. Well, uh, tell me first, how, how does it go further? What, uh, what is the typical reaction after you send a proposal and you wait? Sometimes there might be a few questions from the client in terms of mm -hmm. what exactly does this mean? What does this mean? Um, sometimes if they're looking at proposals from other architects, then they won't even communicate. They'll just come back to you and they'll say, you know, we went with this other architect or we decided mm -hmm. not to use your services. Okay, well, uh, one thing that you can uh, do uh, is, uh, is upfront, in one of the very first meetings that you have, explain how you work. Uh, and with ex explaining how you work is uh, making, uh, making understand two things that are typically unknown by many clients. One is what, how, how does the creative process work? Uh, that is something that uh, many architects assume is clear, but people just don't understand. And it's, it's a simple, uh, the process is in general the same for architects, but you may have your own way to work. And that, and making the client understand that process and what it takes, uh, why do you uh, are going to meet with him and understand what he's looking for, how you're going to make the decisions on design and propose, and when is the uh, clients uh, um, feedback necessary well what points is critical that you make decisions on this and that etc etc that seem uh, they they seem very obvious sometimes for people but uh, clients don't know that unless you're talking to a professional client like a developer maybe or that kind of people but uh, just the, the common person just doesn't know that so taking the time to go through the process even if it's in detail on showing with examples of previous paths of yours, how you came to that idea, when you started. Use those examples that people can relate to. That is already a way of bonding in a way that the client, if the client gets to understand you uh, as well on how do you work, uh, they are gonna uh, value your work 
better, hopefully, as well. So that uh, spending time in all the things you mentioned are also very important, talking about the needs of the client, uh, determining what their program is, talking about their time or budget expectations, etc. Cetera, et cetera. They are very, very important, uh, absolutely. But also let them understand, make sure that they understand how you work. What are they paying for? This is what uh, for clients sometimes is difficult to assess. Mm. Uh, because if they understand exactly uh, what the process is, they are more likely to be able to get a better comparison if they ask offers from other architects, for instance. You you are you're a step forward if if you show more of the you help them understand and making decisions better. Think about moment the moments where you uh, feel like going back to a shop uh, or you want to go and um, buy services or buy products again from a particular place. Most likely it's going to be because they help you making a decision on something. They help you to choose the right product that you were looking for. They help you uh, uh, finding exactly what you were looking for. This is what people like to do. They, you know, you, you want to get services from someone who help you, who help you understanding and making good decisions. So it's, it's, it's interesting to, Put yourself in the place of the client and uh, make sure that they understand what they're getting from you. That is one thing. And that includes uh, also how you work in terms of, of contracts, for instance. Uh, this is something that you also can uh, explain. Part of your working is putting all this process of working, all the scope of work, and all, including all these um, moments where you're going to have uh, to discuss or make decisions with the client also include them in the schedule that will go in your contract so that the contract becomes not just a document with limitations or where clauses that you're going to call if something goes wrong the contract can become a document that you actually use to make the process better uh, so the so the, at the moment that you come up with a proposal, ideally, and this is something that unfortunately doesn't happen often, but ideally, what you're looking for is that uh, what you're putting on paper in a proposal shouldn't be a surprise for your client. It should be just the confirmation of things that you've already discussed and he understood. So uh, that is what you. Uh, as an architect should try to keep in mind from the beginning how do I uh, make my client understand every single point that I'm going to put in my contract beforehand in all these conversations that we're having and agreeing on that so that you know when if you've done that work uh, the contract is going to be just yeah we've gone through this I'm happy with that and that is fine okay great so what you're suggesting just to summarize would be to make sure that the, the proposal is not the first time some of these things are discussed, but that everything's been discussed ahead of time, the details have been cashed out, and informal, you know, kind of there's an understanding of that this is okay from both parties, and then basically we just need to sign the document and let's move forward. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, you may, you may not need to go and discuss every single uh, close and detail sure. in, in a contract but again from the conversations from from finding out how much the client understands how an architect works or not uh, the more or less time you have to spend going through the process and um, you can make it a very informal and friendly way uh, you know how familiar are you with the intellectual property rights uh, do you know what that means? What does entitle? Uh, what are and understand? You know what are what are the process on? You know from uh, from the moment you start talking about the ideas uh, that you have in mind until the final realization of that and what it comes along. So uh, there, there's there's a lot going on in in the meantime and most clients just have no idea. Uh, Many, many people uh, hire an architect for the very first time in their life or maybe the only time in their lives. And uh, on being sensitive to that uh, makes, makes a whole difference. Okay. 
how would you say, say that, let's take a typical scenario that a developer comes into an architect, he's going to build a commercial project maybe in a mm -hmm. downtown area, and he says, listen, I'm, I'm interviewing four different architects, and, you know, I'm, it's going to be this many square feet, this is the kind of building we're thinking of doing, and um, give me a proposal for this, you know, mm -hmm. so the architect's initial inclination is just to go back and make the proposal and send it out. But how, how would you go about opening up that process and turning it into a negotiation instead of just a, okay, here's my fee, and then that's what solely what I'm going to be judged on? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, there's a few things. Uh, there is, it is a reality that uh, the market everywhere in the, around the world, for what I see, uh, sees as normal that architects have to compete by their fees on the one who gets the lowest fees gets a project. Uh, I think uh, in this case with, with developers that are, like, like you said, they are, they are more seasoned in understanding uh, what uh, the process is, how it works. Uh, the trick is to understand their motivations. Uh, uh, get to talk about what they are seeking with their projects. You know, developers uh, are seeking profit, obviously. They, they, they do that for their business and they want to make a lot of money. Uh, but getting to know their, their motivations behind it uh, can help you becoming a partner rather than just uh, an architect uh, who's going to do the design and leave. Uh, when being a partner, uh, being a partner, I mean understanding uh, what type of developer is it, is it? Why is it doing this particular project? Is it? Uh, uh, I, I, I've known a case, for instance, of someone in Russia uh, uh, being extremely difficult with the architects, uh, being on top of them all the time and on questioning every single thing or decision they were proposing on the table. Uh, they, they were getting mad with this 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 guy, uh, an, an architect, uh, and, sorry, and a developer. When they understood uh, after a dinner uh, together and a lot of vodka probably in a, in the game, they understood that uh, this guy's career was depending on the success of this project. He worked for a large development company on. If he didn't succeed uh, with his development, uh, he would lose his job, basically. So there, there were there was a lot more at stake than just you know the finishing a project. It was a personal, uh, very important motivation for that developer to get things uh, right. Uh, this is an example, and, and those things happen. You're just you're dealing with people, not only with positions or roles, and understanding that is very important. Also, understanding the, the background of the development, who, how is it financed? How is it? I know another architect also was working with a small developer, who proposed to the developer uh, a lower fee upfront, but he would share the profit after the houses were sold. That was a very interesting uh, proposal for the for the developer because uh, you he he wasn't offer a lower fee he was just uh, postponing the profit to to a later moment he was in the position of doing that and, um, and by doing that he became also a business partner for the developer uh, this, this is again spending some time to understand what's uh, what's behind the scenes, what's behind what you see on paper, on what it counts in a briefing, uh, and understand what people go and what, what they actually need, what they're looking for. Excellent. So I really like that, Mariana, what you mentioned about uh, the contract negotiations in terms of, so it sounds like you need to listen, you need to be able to ask questions, you need to be able to dig really deep. And then a lot of times, if it comes down to what you think are fees, Try to figure out another way to come to a, an agreement without lowering your fees. So that could be, you know, putting some of the fees to the back end. It could be adding additional value to the project and what you're offering. So all excellent pointers. I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Felt like I've gotten a little bit more information and a strong strategic foundation for negotiating. You know, focus on the strategy. Any parting words that you would like to say to the audience, Mariana? 
Well, uh, as a final word, I would say uh, something that, that you mentioned as well, and that is a reality. Many architects uh, get to hear, uh, sorry, we're going with someone else who has a lower fee. When you hear that, uh, uh, be open for the confrontation. Ask the client, can I see the proposal of the other architect? Uh, no pressure whatsoever, but I would like to help you understand whether are you getting the same services for the for that price again many clients just you know don't know they see a bold part figure and uh they if they don't understand the process completely there is a really big chance that when you see another proposal someone else's proposal you can help the client saying well, watch out here because this or this is not included or here you may come to a point that if this doesn't happen, it can get expensive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the client either, you know, best case scenario, they could say, actually, you're right. You know, it's like comparing pears and apples, it's a different story, and make sure that you help them making the right decision. That's what it has to be based on. Worst case scenario, if you actually find someone's proposal that is doing the same job for a lower fee, you may want to go back to your own process and see how can I improve my own internal processes to be more cost efficient. Maybe there's something that you have to change. Um, even if they choose to go to another client, uh, to another architect, for whatever reason it is, they will always remember you like someone who tried to help them making a good decision, and that's invaluable. Excellent. Mariana, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. A fascinating background. Thank to you, Enoch. I'm glad to hear you enjoyed it too. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there, and I will send you instant access to free resources, including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway. <laughs>